The following production is brought to you by the Talkin' Buds Leaf Show. Here we go, Talkin' Buds Leaf Show. How's it going, everyone? I'm Rob. He's Ryan. A rare Monday edition due to a rare Sunday night game against the Carolina Hurricanes. 12 games remain. The Leafs remain the third seed in the Atlantic Division. I said this last week, and I'll reiterate today. I feel like my, my whole existence as a Leaf fan is just sort of centering around the Boston Bruins and the Florida Panthers. That is consuming my thoughts with respect to being a Leaf fan. And... You know, you look at this past week, which included a really nice Saturday night win at home against the Edmonton Oilers, a feel-good win. That's always a marquee night on the schedule. You circle that game on the schedule, and you come away feeling good because of how they played against an elite opponent. But it's funny, I'm, I'm still watching, and I, I'm not in the moment. I'm not like, look at them shutting down McDavid and Dreisaitl. I'm like, if they can play like this against the Bruins or the Panthers, this yeah. is what's going to give them a shot. Because it does feel a bit David and Goliathy with either of these teams. Well, any, any small thing that works, you're just like, maybe. Yeah, do that. Maybe if we do that, it will. this will translate. And uh, who knows if it will or not. But that's, I get what you're saying. That's where you're at, where you're seeing anything to hold on to that's positive. And you're like, maybe if they just did that against Marshan, they, they, they got it. But if you, who would you take? Because for, for me, I'm leaning Bruins. I never thought the day would come where I would say I'd prefer a first round matchup against the Bruins. However, I think that there's an emotional element to that matchup that I think will help lift the Leafs, help them in that series. I think that, that they can get into it more than if you're going against the Florida Panthers who have been a juggernaut since the playoffs last year and a juggernaut all year this year. And in my, from what I've seen and heard and read, the consensus Stanley Cup favorite throughout the league. Yeah. And it's honestly, it's it's pretty, even though they face each other and there's a history there, it is kind of a fresh playoff matchup. Like they haven't played each other in the playoffs in a long time. And if you look at the Bruins of old and the Bruins of now, you're not, you don't have Big Z on the back just shutting down anybody he wants, and you don't have the best defensive centerman to maybe ever play the game going against your team. So even though there's a lot of history there, it is kind of a fresh matchup, and you think, and you saw what the Bruins did last year against the against uh, the Panthers in the first round. Like, they they didn't win. The, the, the goaltending kind of went dry. You just think that if, if they're going to do it, if they're going to ever win anything, in this league, they're going to have to slay some dragons. And this is the ultimate dragon for this franchise is beating the Boston Bruins. Which is, yeah, which is what I mean when I say I think that there's an emotional element here that will help lift them. But also, there's also an emotional element there where they just can't do it. Yes. But well, I don't know. Like the Bru like you're looking at the Panthers matchup, like this is just a way better hockey team. And there's just no way, even if we play our best, that we could beat this team. With the Bruins, you're kind of looking at the rosters going. I don't I don't necessarily agree. I would say I wouldn't say the Panthers are way better. The the Panthers work harder. And if if you're going to beat the Florida Panthers, the same thing goes for the Bruins, quite honestly. If you're going to beat either one of these teams, you need to commit to outworking your opponent every single shift. And I think if you look at the the Euler game this last weekend and you look at the clip that was making the rounds of, on Twitter of uh, Joel Edmondson making life very difficult on Dreisaitl, that's the kind of stuff you point to. Max Domi gives the belt after that game. He gives it to Edmondson. And he goes, can't wait to see this guy in the playoffs. Because it's like, yes, that's the type of thing that... That's the level they're going to need to go to and the best players are going to need to go to yeah, that, in order to the, beat either one of these two teams. You're handing, you're giving flowers to a six defenseman right now. Yeah. How about we give the belt to one of the top guys for playing like that? Yeah. That's the problem. Yes. And so that can't wait to see this guy do it in the playoffs. 
but he's on the third pair and will probably see the least amount of minutes at any D. 100%. And I think that when you look at the, the Panthers and the Bruins, that is what has people sort of scratching their head going, on paper, the Leafs can hang with either one of these teams. It's when the puck drops and you got to go into the corners and when the middle of the ice isn't available and you got to take the well, classic. Let's just, let's just ask the question right now. They need to outwork them on every shift. Are they capable of doing that? In the playoffs in the past, they haven't shown that. No. And, but I, I listen, though, it, it's kind of like I said last week about Sheldon Keefe calling these guys into his office, and you were like, oh, I, it's crazy if he's still doing that. But I'm telling you, like, I, that is happening. Like, like these guys, you're, you're having a sit down conversation with your leadership group, and you're going, guys, like, we, these are who, these are the two teams we're playing. This is how we beat them. If you're not going to buy into doing that, we're not going to win. It's that simple. Okay, so let's look at the four best players on this team who are going to have to provide the big goals at the big moments. I know depth is very important in the playoffs, but let's look at the four guys who've been here the whole time. Is John Tavares capable of doing that? At this point in the season, he's no. he's struggled. He's not. Is Mitch Marner capable of doing that? If he wants to, yes. I think, you're looking, I, think, at, I, think, I think you're looking at 34 and 88 to be like... No, I think you take Tavares out of it, and, and we're going to have a conversation about the lineup in a minute. And Because to me, John Tavares... And yes, we can go on and oh, he makes 11 million, blah, blah, blah. Like, there's no point. That's that's spilt milk at this point. Tavares is a guy that's going to have to be deployed correctly, and that's going to be on Keefe to do that, given where his, his limitations at this point in his career. But you look at the other three guys, and you go... You got like it's, you just got to do it. What you're kind of banking on is there's just some maturity. Yes, that you're getting in your late twenties. You're gonna be thirty years old within like pretty soon. You're kind of in the prime of your career right now. We all look at Alexander Ovechkin Stanley Cup as he finally matured that season, and Barry Trotz got them to buy into a system, and that's kind of all you're hoping for. Yeah, it's just having. Just you have to have the desire to play that way, to play a way that. In the past, you kind of shied away from. And yeah. you have to accept that if you want to win, and they say all the right stuff. All these guys say that the cup's the goal and all that stuff. It's like, okay, well, here it is. This is the lane to get there. This is the road you have to take to get there. And it's a bumpy road. I feel like we'll be sitting here with gray hair still talking about this exact thing well, over and over and over again. Because I'm just I'm just thinking to myself, even if they play their absolute best like is it still good enough or or they just don't have that in them i the so boston bruins can get to a level that they can't get to so let's let's transition into the the lineup discussion because i do think they have guys on this team this year that they have not had in previous years that will help them like playoff style players the big storylines this week, there were two. It's obviously you got Marner and Yarncroft out with an injury. So you had Max Domi move up to the first line with Austin Matthews and instant chemistry. You put, we talked about Matthews looking kind of lost for a bit there without Marner. You put a speedy puck distributing w winger with him and look at that. It instantly starts working. And then the second thing was a defense and the help, the scratching of TJ Brody. So let's start with the forwards. Sheldon is doing a lot of line experimentation right now. I criticized him last week because I find that he's a bit too trigger happy still. Like, I understand that you want to use these last um, few games, these last dozen games to kind of see what works and get your lines set for the playoffs. But I still find he's he's a bit too trigger happy and he doesn't give, afford these guys a lot of time to sort of develop chemistry and you're missing two guys who are automatically plugged into your lineup when yes. they're healthy yes and it's like Domi's a perfect example he puts Domi with Math Matthews and because of those two guys skill sets there's an instant connection there so he sticks with it whereas I don't think every group of players is like that and I think you need to give a guys give guys a bit more time to develop anyways so you look at the forward lines I think Max Domi's got to stay in your top six ahead of game one. I think he's shown, I've said this all year, I'm not a big pat myself on the back guy on this podcast. I don't do it a whole hell of a lot, but I've been saying all year, having this guy on the third line 
at 11 minutes a night, you're not getting the best version out of him. And playing center. That how never made dude, any sense. How did this dude play in the top six for the Dallas Stars who went to the West final last year? And he's he can't do that here. It's ridiculous. So I think you gotta you gotta keep him up there in your top six. Where do you slot everybody else? Especially as you just pointed out with with Marner and Yarncroc will 100 percent be in the in the lineup for game one. So you look initially, I'd like let's give Domi with Marner and Matthews a look, but then that has a trickle down effect for the last of for the rest of your lineup, particularly like who's who's in your third line center spot. Bobby McMahon, another great week for Bobby McMahon. Hell of a game against the Oilers. Giving him a look in the top six. Yeah. Make, makes a lot of sense to me. A guy who's shown he has some scoring touch. Whatever whatever happened to having John Tavares on the third line? Well, who centers the second line? I know. They don't have enough centermen. Yes. Here's the problem. Yes, like, that is, that's the problem. Here's what you do. You put Matthews centering the first line. John Tavares centering the second line. Then you have David Camp, your only other centerman, centering your third line. And then whoever's on the fourth line, Connor whether Dewar. it's Connor Dewar or Pontus Holmberg, that, that's just how you got to go. I think, though, if you look at like the lineup they had against Carolina where he's got Nyes and Robertson, I think the the thought with putting Pontus there is Pontus is a bit more offensive upside than David Kampf. Yeah. So if your third line wingers are, I don't believe Nick Robertson is going to be in the game one lineup. Let's no. just say that. Like the kid, he got a nice goal against Carolina, but I just, he. No, it's he's not. not. You, you compare him to, to a Bobby McMahon. I know Bobby McMahon's older, but. You compare him to Bobby McMahon, it's not like he, this guy got leapfrogged on the depth chart. Well, if you don't have Tavares or Nylander on a third line, that line is limited offensively right off the bat. Yeah. Like then you got to look towards maybe finding a a line that's going to forecheck as hard as possible or shut down another team's top line. Because if you're looking at camp. Nyes, McMahon, Yarn Croak, whoever fits it on that third line. Like that, that's not a very great offensive line to start with. So how do you feel about this? Austin Matthews, game one lineup. Austin Matthews between Max Domi and Mitch Marner. William Nylander between Tyler Bertuzzi and Bobby McMahon, yeah. second line. You have to, if you want to get offense on every single line, because Tavares has not had a great year, but lately he has been producing offensively. Um, you have to have Hibber Nylander on that third line if you really want to make that line an offensive threat. Unless somebody just plays out of their mind and just has the playoff of the century, like Matt and I's or And I guess, I think Tavares and McMahon have shown they have chemistry together. So maybe you you drop McMahon and Tavares down to the third line. You got Nylander on the second line, and you put like Yarncroc and Bertuzzi with him. But then he is that can he make plays with either one of those guys? Yeah, I don't know. There's I would say that you know he Nylander's the best skater of the puck with this team. I think Nylander is the only guy oh, on this, on this team, team where you can put him with anybody, and he and nothing's gonna change out of his game. Like he he just commands the puck 24 7 he always has it on his stick he's always streaking through the neutral zone he's always circling around the offensive zone he's the number one guy where you can play him with anybody you can play him with connor dewar and noah gregor and he's gonna look the exact same as he's playing with john tavares and bobby mcmahon i'm with you on the the third line idea because if you if you want scoring touch out of if you want depth scoring, we've we've come on here in playoffs past and we've gone on and on about like they don't get any depth scoring. Like we need someone to score a big they don't goal. Get any good, they don't even get star scoring. Yeah, where's our where's our Nick Paul? Where's our Nick Paul? Then you're right. You can't like if if Tavares is gonna be on the th the third line center, then yeah, you gotta put McMahon with him or someone else who can shoot the puck in the net as opposed to putting him with I don't know. And like where does Matt Nyes fit in? I think you keep him on like your third line could potentially be I love Matt Nyes because you can put him anywhere. So you could go Tavares, Nyes, McMahon. Here's what well, they you play you, the same side. You need either Tyler Bertuzzi, Bobby McMahon, or Matt Nyes. To, to find a spot in this lineup where they're contributing offensively, yeah. where they're a threat. It's one of those three guys has to fit in with somebody on those three lines where if McMahon can get in the op uh, get an opportunity to shoot the puck, if 
I, I'm nice. I love his game, but he, he it, in his rookie season, he hasn't really found his offensive scoring touch yet. Tyler Bertuzzi's been way better the second half of the season, trying to find the back of the net, banging in pucks. At some point, like, one of those three guys has to fit in with Tavares or Nylander on that second and third line and be an offensive scoring threat. So you didn't outright dismiss my try William Nylander at center no, idea. Because I think William Nylander's line, he just don't, like, it's Me- just. Remember what a fuss they made about this in training camp? Oh, we're going to stick with it. We're going to stick with it. That yeah. lasted five they just minutes. Don't, but like you look at their line, they just don't have the center depth. Like they have three centers and one of them is, is cannot provide any offense for you. So, I mean, you got to do what you, I saw, I watched Max Domi play center for half the year. The guy's not a centerman. So what's the, Nylander's a better player than Domi, so if you throw him in the middle, what the, what the hell's the difference? You're still yeah. not going to get great defensive reliability out of that center position with Nylander in there like, Do- like Domi was. But And that's why I think you put Yarncroc on the second line with him, because Yarncroc can provide you that 200-foot reliable game yeah. that, that maybe you might not get if, if you've got Nylander there with Nyes and... Yeah, Yarncroc. Yeah, maybe move Nyes up. I think Nyes, McMahon, or Bertuzzi are going to be, like, one of them has to show up and be a factor, which they've all been playing good hockey lately. Like, it's not like they're playing well. I need to see more out of them right now. It's just, like, if you're looking at depth guys providing offense, like, those are three guys who have the bodies and the strength to play playoff hockey they all forecheck. They all work hard. I think one of those three guys is going to have to come up big for them in any spot that they're slotted in. Yeah. And they're centered. Like, you're never going to find the right. Like, this. I feel like he's going to be tinkering with this 24-7. Like, you're just, they just don't have enough centermen. They just don't. So, I think you're going to see it change a lot. There's no right answer, really. What do you think of Pontus? Like, Pontus has shown, like, offensive flashes this year. Like there's been nights where you've he's played well, but I think when you when you're in a playoff series where every inch of ice is being contested, you look at it and go, can Pontus Holmberg be a guy who who thrives in that? Because I think Pontus is in the lineup, whether it's third line center, fourth line wing, whatever. I, Pontus Holmberg is in the lineup. For Nick Robertson one. comes out, yeah. and then Connor Dewar or Noah Noah Gregor come out. Yeah. So you think Reeves is in the is in the lineup for game no one. because. Gregor comes out, Marner goes in, yeah. Dewar comes out, Yar- or no, Robinson. What am I saying right now? Robertson comes out, yeah. and then either <laughs> Dewar or Gregor come yeah. out. There you so go. Yes. I like Noah Gregor. I, I, I want Dewar, to. Dewar's not coming out. So I, I don't know. Uh, Dewar's not coming out. I have fourth line. Like for, a fourth line is very important, obviously. You don't want to be losing the fourth line minutes, but like, I'm not. Like, we have bigger things to worry about than. than how we're slotting the fourth line perfectly. I don't care who's on that line. They just need to force a job. And yes. try to win the offensive possession time. That yes. that's your job. Fourth line is the definition of you have one job. Yeah, and if you provide offensively, that is great. Yeah, I'm have very happy. Okay, let's look at the defense pairings. Like I said earlier, the the big story was them finally giving TJ Brody a little rest. It's been it's been a tough year for for TJ Brody. It's I know he's had some personal stuff go on off the ice and feel badly for him. Because of that, but there it's been it's been a tough go. And you look at this the, the way they had it paired against Carolina, and the fact that Mark Giordano, I'm thinking, will be back for the playoffs. So does he slot in? Who's your ideal? I think given the two teams you're likely facing, you want you want Jake McCabe will be a factor, Joel Edmondson will be a factor, Labushkin will be a factor. Like those three guys are a hundred percent. You can slot those three guys in right away. Riley, 100%. And then I think it's you kind of look at everyone else and go, you got Lilligren, you got Brody, you got Giordano, you got Connor Timmons, you got... I'm I'm not putting in Mark Giordano. I'm sorry. Really? No. I'm not. This conversation is a lot... I, I find we could sit and talk about the forward line so we're blue in the face because they... Like yeah, they 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 lack the ability to play the the style they need to play to win in the playoffs. But there's a lot of names there. There's a lot of talented names there. we and guys who are having great seasons, like Bobby McMahon. Like there's some exciting guys. I scroll down the page. I look at these six names, and I go, "What? There's no right answer. They all suck. Like like it's just they're they're not good enough, man. Like it does not matter." 
who they put it's tough. who with. It's tough. This is, yeah. I look at these six names and I think to myself, this is not good enough to beat the Florida Panthers or the Boston Bruins. Like, I just don't think these six guys, like, are they capable of, of playing? Because the series is going six or seven with the Bruins, guaranteed. Like, are these guys, could these guys do it? Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think... Lilligren is not coming out of the lineup. No, no, they really want him to. And they, now he's playing PP one. Yeah. So they, they really want him to, like, unless like if they're extremely displeased with TJ Brody, then. But if he's not, if he's in the lineup, he's he's on like the first pair. Yeah. So it's just I I don't know this to this me, conversation to, is, is 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 it's. To me, it comes down to because uh, I'm with you. I think I don't think Lilligren's coming out. I think they really want Lilligren in there. I think they see him as an important piece. The fact that he's a, also a right-handed yeah. shot, like they really, they really value that about him. So it really comes down to, in my opinion, is it TJ Brody or is it Mark Giordano? You are getting. I know exactly what I'm getting from TJ Brody, Jake McCabe, Ilya Labushkin, and Timothy Lilligren. The two names that I look at on here, like Morgan Riley needs to play like he played in the first round last season against the Lightning. He was amazing, incredible. We need him to elevate his game and be, he's never going to be a number one shutting people down, but we if he's going to be Mr. Offense, number one defenseman, he's got to provide the offense that he provided last year in the first round. And then Joel Edmondson, we haven't seen him in the playoffs. He's a big guy. We saw him against the Leafs when he was with the Habs when they blew the 3-1 lead. And we know he's he can be a pain in the ass when it comes to handling guys in front of the net. So hopefully he can elevate his game. And we also saw what Luke Shen did last year, too, where a supposed third-pairing guy stepped up and was on their top pair, and he played incredible. So based on what you just said, you're saying that you're going with TJ Brody over Mark Giordano I for game one. I think sticking Mark Giordano in the lineup after missing time, like, it's just... I, it's a lot to ask, I yes. don't know what you're expecting. Like, I... Uh, Giordano brings like more of an edge, a 40 year old edge than TJ Brody. Like we've seen him, he'll, he'll drop the gloves. He'll, he's just, he's just a great guy. But in terms of what you're getting out of a defenseman and, and their skill, like, I just, I don't know if, I don't know if it's the right move to put him in. Joe wall. Didn't love his first period against the Carolina hurricanes settled in and was excellent in the second and third period. We'll give the cut the guy a break. He's he's just still coming back from an injury and hasn't got back into the swing of things as of yet. We've talked a lot about is it Wall or is it Samsonov for game one? I think it's I think it's Joe Wall. When I watch Joe Wall play net, I think this guy, if he stays healthy, is going to be a top ten to five. Ten, I don't know. Ten, it's like a Top five goalie in this league. I'm Top gonna, five? I'm going oh to my God. St- like give the hot take of the century right now. I love the way this guy plays goalie. He's got to stay healthy. I know. he. That's the problem. It's If he's not healthy, he's useless. But when he's, he just, he's just like, he looks like he, he's been to every single goalie coaching conference on the, he plays just like so textbook where Samsonov is, Samsonov has played very well. Like, I'm not, this isn't a knock on Samsonov, but when you watch Wall play net, and I'm not a goaltending expert, but you compare him to other top goalies in the league, like, I think he kind of has it. I think he's just, I think he's incredible. And I'm and I'm staking my claim as Joe Wall's biggest supporter right now. Your team, Joe Wall. I am. Yeah, I but think. If Samsonov is playing, but, like, he did miss a lot of time. He's come back. He's been... He's been good. He's been okay. It's not like he he was playing like he was before he got injured, but I mean, ideally, I think everybody would want Joe Wall to be. The oh, you're guy. talking Joe Wall? Oh, I thought I thought you were talking Samson. No, I'm there. just saying I don't no. want to knock Samson off. Yeah. Like Samson off's playing great hockey. Yeah. Like he's he's been he's been he, fantastic. He fell to the he 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 seemingly has a knack for falling to the ice like he's been shot. Yeah, and getting carried <laughs> off the ice. And then, did you see Keith's post game? He got asked about it, and he, Keith was very like, "It's not as bad as it looked." Like well, that's he like was, what happened in practice. Yeah, last he week. he really has a has a knack for yeah. for five minutes. We thought he was done for the season, yeah. and, then, and then five minutes later, it was like, 
No, he's fine. Yeah, he really has a he's he's showing a trend of of being really like I don't want to say dramatic, but like he's be, he's a bit dramatic. You know what I like about both those guys right now though is they're both playing like I didn't love Joe Wall's start in that game, but then he just like he Settled made the in. saves yes. he had to make to keep them in the game. Yes. I think Ilya Samsonov, whether he's giving up one goal or three goals, he's making the saves when they need them to, to either win the game at a critical time or stay in the game. I think both of them are doing a good job of making the saves at very important times and not just giving up back-breaking goals. Yes. Without question, in my opinion, we talked about, you know, can can they play the way they need to play to beat these teams come playoff time? Even if they go out there and say, we're buying in, we're going to compete for every inch of ice, they have the 27th PK in the National Hockey League, and you're just, you're not going to win. And there's no, you, you talked about this last week, there's no quick fix coming for this. So, we just talked about the goalies. It's got to be, they have to be, Joe Wall, Samsonov, whoever is in the net, has to be your best penalty killer come playoff time because this unit has shown it's just not there. It's not good enough. It's not, they're not going to have an overnight sort of resurgence and figure it out all of a sudden. That's that, not I mean, how That's it all works. you can really hope for. Yeah. It's just like game one of the playoffs. You're, everyone's at the same number. So you said it last week and I saw a lot of other people reiterate the sentiment where it's like a, a good penalty kill is just working hard. And I watch them, and it's like, it doesn't look like, like, it looks like they're trying. It doesn't look like anybody's out there, like, kind of on a Sunday skate or whatever. Yeah. It's just, they move the puck, or, the other team just moves the puck around at will. And getting in the lanes is a real struggle. And you said it, and I noticed it a lot in this last week. When they do interrupt a pass or disrupt the play, get it out. Get it out. Yeah, and got- we we sort of said the defense struggle, um, with with moving the puck, but it's the forwards too, man. Like the yeah. forwards, like get it the puck on your stick and get it down the ice. Well, I think when you look at their penalty kill too, I just don't think their D is good enough. That like it, there's top defensemen all around the league playing on the first penalty kill who can skate and move the puck, and they're also on the first power play unit. They just they don't have that like number one D out there with a long stick and just has the ability to make a play below the goal line to get the puck out. Like I just, I think they lack a little they, where they struggle on defense that, that kind of kills them on the penalty kill too, because like here we are looking at McCabe and Brody on the f- killing penalties. Like they're, they're okay defensemen, but I'm looking at Colorado. I see Kale McCarr on the penalty kill. It's like, I can make a play below the goal line, separate a man from the puck, be quick enough to make a move and get, get the puck out. Like I last thing I want to hit on before we get out of here today. And I think it has to do with the defense. We talked about the defense pairings and guys like Lilligren and Riley and stuff jumping up into the rush. What the fuck is going on with the odd man rushes and the clean cut breakaways? Yeah. The there Carolina Hurricanes <laughs> yeah, had like five or six. Yeah. And it's it's and it's also when they're on the power play, gets caught out of position. How many times in the last few weeks have you seen this power play give up a two on one the other way? It's almost every time. Like, what is going on? I think they do kind of miss Mitch Marner on the power play a little bit because Matthews is not when Matthews has it on like the half wall and he's like trying to make a pass. He can sometimes stick handle himself out of like there's a guy coming towards him and he can't make a move and then the guy poke checks him and then it's two on one going the other way. I, yeah, it's just like I don't I don't understand yeah. what I'm watching. It's like well, you they have the man advantage. It's almost to the point now with the power play. It's like just decline it, just decline it. Say <laughs> say maybe, no thanks. Maybe they were down yeah. two and they were just like whatever. We we gotta we gotta get one in here. But yeah, they gave up a lot of two on ones. Yes, yes, and that's the type of stuff we talk about. Commitment to playing the right way and winning in the playoffs. Like you can't give the Florida Panthers two on ones. What killed me. On one of the power plays um, against the, uh, the against the Hurricanes was, it's like at the end they took they had a power play at the end of the second period. Matthews goes, he's running out of time, so he skates his absolute hardest through the neutral zone through the defense, and then it set up an odd man opportunity for them where someone got a great 
scoring chance. And I was like, look what happens when yes. you're not skating yes. a kilometer an hour yeah, yeah, yeah. through the neutral zone. Yeah. Look what happens when one of the best players in the world gets it on his stick and gets in the zone and creates kind of like a two-on-one opportunity and below the goal line. It's like That's a beautiful point because that brings us full circle to how we started the episode and what we'll get out of here on. When you look at the best players, it's that sense of urgency that I think is sometimes lacking. And when he has that sense of urgency in this case because time is running out, he takes over and he dominates. And it's that mindset that these guys need to be in. I've said forever on the power play, I don't want to see anyone skating the puck in the zone that isn't number 88. But he's the only guy that can take it and go across the blue line with ease and doesn't do that stupid lateral pass just inside the blue line that some lo- sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. I don't have a problem with the lateral pass, but like I just I have a problem. I don't know how they're not in the video room looking at everybody going, why are we not skating? Like, why are we barely moving when we're trying to get in the zone? Because they just stack everybody at the blue line. And when we're barely moving, then they make the lateral pass. And then it's just like, it's not quick enough. Yep. Like, we need to be have some pace here, boys. Like, we're supposed to be a hockey team that plays with pace and is great in transition. Why are we barely moving trying to enter the offensive zone on the power play? I don't, I don't get it. It's, it's like, it's. Like, we're on here. We're two dummies. Like, we're not experts. Anybody on their couch could sit and watch that power play and go, they're barely moving. Can I? You just said said this. Can I just just say something right here? Some of y'all who comment on this video, we're not experts. We've never professed to be experts. Our vibe is to not be experts. We're two guys shooting the shit. Okay. If you want to come on here and you want to pick point out everything that is wrong with what we're saying, go watch another video. This is not for you. It's unbelievable. Like, just look at our vibe. Do we look like two guys who are sitting in the film room? No. We're, we're two guys who get on here and just run our mouths for half an hour. But that guy and us can realize that when you are skating a kilometer an hour trying to get in the zone yes. on the power play, it's not going to work. Exactly. No, no kills. The funny, the best play is when Riley is behind the net and he skates with pace all the way up just past the red line to throw it all the way back <laughs> to the fucking goal line where Matthews is barely skating. Yeah, it's like, oh God, what are we doing? You were already there. Yeah. You were already doing what you were supposed to do. Like, yeah. it's hilarious how he just. He literally skates as fast as he can to throw the puck back to the goal line. I'm I'm fixated on on what you just pointed out about Matthews because he's just letting his natural instincts take over, and look what happens. The whole issue with the power play is all these guys are in their head about the struggling power play, and you can see them all, and no matter who, what new guys they bring into that unit, it's like they're swallowed up by this identity crisis that the first that PP1 is having, and they're all out there, and you can see them all thinking. But they were doing, they've been doing this for years. Like, this is not a new thing for them. Like, they always, they've had this play in their back pocket for years, and it, and it doesn't work in the playoffs. And, you, like, I just, I can't, I don't understand how there's coaches being paid a lot of money to study video and coach up professional athletes, and they can't look at a power play film session and go, we gotta we gotta do something a little different here. Guy Boucher, the Bond villain. I know we're T five in the in the power play in the league, but that all goes away when the playoffs start. Yes. And you can say that to your penalty kill too. It's like I know we're 27th right now and we're awful, but game one, everyone's at zero. Yes. So, so it's kind of the same thing both ways. That's a great point. And I think if you're if you're that unit, that's what you're talking about in practice. Yeah. You're saying for, for the next twelve games, we're just trying to get better. I don't care about where we are in the standings. I don't care about anything anything to do with that. We're just trying to get better, and we're going to take it one PK at a time. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So as I said off the top, 12 games left. They got this week coming up. They got the Devils, the Capitals, and then the Sabres on Saturday. I mean, you look at this. They haven't played the Devils all year. They play, Out of these final 12 games, they play the New Jersey Devils three times. This schedule this year, I don't know what the NHL was doing making the schedule this year, but it's been weird. Like, no Western Conference teams at all in these final 12 games. Yeah, but their record against the Western Conference, exactly. what was it, 24-6 and something? Exactly. Like, oh, my exactly. God. Exactly. 
the Washington Capitals. Again, we saw the Capitals last week. The, the, the Capitals as a franchise. Spencer Carberry just pro- has a practice, and he brings all his guys in, and he goes, see that guy over there? He's going to break Wayne Gretzky's goal record. Yeah, but they're in the playoffs. So everything this franchise does at all times is about getting the puck on this guy's stick so he can score a goal. They have a negative 27 goal differential, and they're in <laughs> the second wild card spot. I know. Spot. It's pretty. It's pretty. I didn't think they were anything special when we saw them last week. Like, I know the Leafs dummy them. No, if, that's if, a good matchup for them. Yeah. Yeah. If we learned anything from the Philadelphia Flyers this past week, teams get motivated after you lay a beating on them. So I'm not expecting the Leafs to run through them. And then like, you, you look at the Devils like that. That's also I'm I'm OK with them playing them three times. That's a that's a good matchup for them as well. well they're a team that like it's not a tough hockey. Lindy team. Ruff lost his job because the Devils can't get a save, basically. Yeah. And they're just not a tough team. And then you got the Buffalo Sabres, which you throw the Sabres in there with the Senators, man. Like, I don't care yeah, what yeah. their record is. I don't care how their season has gone. They are – they. the Leafs never have an easy night against the Buffalo Sabres. Never. Do you think it's just, like, a weird coincidence that they've played so well against Western teams this year? Or is, like, there's something to that? Because they've sucked in their division. Like, the division's different, but even just, like, I don't know. It's just pretty insane how they've have they've played so well. Because there's a lot of great Western teams, but they've beat the Jets. They've beaten the Oilers. They've beaten and it's Colorado. Funny because, it's funny because the West always had the rep of being, like, the big, mean conference out of the two. But that's really flipped, I find. Like, they're not... Like the, the team that is is the big mean team in the NHL now is the Florida Panthers. Like yeah. you look at the West, like there's some good teams in the Western Conference for sure, but you don't like look at them. Like if you look at any of the top teams in the West, like Colorado's a good team, but they're they're like um you don't think of like like they're big and tough. They're a yeah. skilled team. Dallas, and then same Vegas thing. when they get out when they get yeah. healthy and get after it. They're yes, the Vancouver Canucks, yeah, are there, uh, who have been in first place since the drop of the puck this year. Again, not a team that is going to like make it difficult on you physically. Just really skilled. So maybe they they do sort of match up better. The, the, some of these top tier West teams play a style that the Leafs like playing. Yeah, because the 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 sort of book on the Leafs is like you saw at that clip that was circulating of of Brad Marchand. That is just the biggest fake tough guy performance of all time. Oh, God. But that's the book on the Leafs. It's just get in their face early yeah. and start talking smack and hope they back down. And we said it last week. That's what both Florida and Boston are going to do the second the puck drops in game one, and they have to be ready for it. Yeah. I actually liked Marner's response in that clip where they line up at the faceoff, and he's just, Marchand's running his mouth, and Marner's just like, oh, my God, man. Yeah, like, yeah. Dude, like, we get it. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. I that video was being thrown around like Marner is, is isn't like look how easy you can take advantage of Marner. I dis- I didn't get that. Brad vibe at all. is yeah. such a little weasel man. Yeah, like yeah. oh my god. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I would just look at him and be like, do it. Yeah, do it, man. Yeah. Fake, fake tough yeah. guy is the term. You, how about you ankle pick me going in the corner? Like he's yeah. such a dirty. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, can't stand him. But that's a good point, though. If you look at the three teams that are the worst matchups for them, I'm circling Florida, Boston, and, and Carolina. Yep. Like those are the three teams that play a style of hockey that they just have they have a hard time handling. But, but Carolina's a bit different. We've seen Carolina a few times here as of late. Carolina's a bit different because I just think the Hurricanes are extremely well coached. Yeah. Like every every I is dotted and T is crossed. They are on their details. They are always in position. They take care of the puck. Classic hockey coach speak. Take care of the puck. They they take care of the puck so well. Whereas like, like they don't bring that physical intimidation aspect that the Panthers and the Bruins do. They are just so buttoned up. And if you make a mistake, it's going the other way. But I feel like you're never walking away from a hurricane game being like I, I saw a lack of effort tonight. No, that's what I mean. They're yeah. they are they are buttoned up and they're yeah. extreme. Like the fact that Rod Brindamore doesn't have a contract for next season is insanity. Yeah. Insanity. And if something happens with the Leafs where it doesn't work out in the first round, and they decide to move on from Sheldon Keefe. I'm picking up the phone and I'm saying, Rod, what do you want? Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's a blank check. What do you yeah, want? Yeah, 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 Get yeah. in here. Let's go. They got to look at their own goaltending. Yes. Like, well, yeah. I, I, Freddie Anderson back from the blood clot issue, and I thought he looked. 
I, one thing we know about Freddie Anderson is there's regular season Freddie and playoff Freddie. Yeah. So we'll see what it looks like in the playoffs. But I thought he was I thought he was lights out. He was excellent against yeah. the Leafs. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna get out of here. Like I said, the march is on. Next week we'll be back in our usual Sunday time slot. So if you wanna if you wanna join and watch that video, hit that like and subscribe button below. We love all the comments. We love all the engagements. I chirped you guys earlier about there's a select few people who just love to come on and treat us like we work for Sportsnet or TSN or something. And it's like that's not what the vibe of this show is. But hey, you do you, man. Spread the word, tell your friends. We really appreciate it. Also, leave a review if you're listening to the podcast version of this. Every little bit helps. We'll see you guys next time.